Thank you, Reynold and Brooke. I'm really excited about the great work of Project Zen, as well as the integration of Qualys into Spark. It's going to make it a lot easier to execute data science at scale. When it comes to data science, one of the biggest areas of interest today is machine learning. The ML4 project has had a huge impact on this, becoming the most widely adopted open source machine learning platform in the world. Here to tell us more about how this project has evolved is Matei Zaharia, Chief Technologist at Databricks. All right, I'm really excited to give an update on MLflow, the open machine learning platform that we launched as an open source project at this conference actually three years ago. Um, so in 2011, uh, Mark Andreessen uh, said that software is eating the world. He was observing that in more and more industries, software had become essential to performing uh, well in that industry. Um, and uh, you know, it was, it was one of the key differentiating factors between companies and products and so on. Most recently, um, a lot of uh, uh, folks have been saying that AI is actually eating software. And the reason for that is that AI has actually started to play really important roles in large classes of software or even to replace previous systems that involved a lot of custom bus business logic and do quite a bit uh, better with it. Uh, so just as some examples of that, um, you know, recently um, OpenAI used GPT-3, a variant of GPT-3, uh, to just generate images from text. You can just imagine, you know, some of the applications uh, of this for something commercial. Um, Google has been using AI for medical um, diagnosis, for example, measuring hemoglobin levels uh, in a patient just from retina scans without an invasive procedure. Um, and OpenAI has been uh, basically um, uh, revolutionizing the way that we can uh, train robots to perform various tasks so that instead of fine-grained rules you specify for how the robot will move, it can actually just learn how to do uh, specific tasks efficiently. So AI has obviously impacted all aspects of business, but today it's only done that for a select uh, few companies, you know, the Facebooks, Googles, uh, Netflixes, and Ubers of the world who can run these massive, uh, you know, engineering and development programs and build these kinds of applications. Uh, so the natural question is, you know, what about the rest of us? So interestingly, when you look at these massive tech companies that are successful using AI today, uh, one of the reasons they're successful is because they've done massive investments in the underlying platforms. It's actually not so much uh, you know, the algorithmic insights that they have in there, you know, someone comes up with a new algorithm. It's actually the infrastructure to actually take these algorithms and turn them into a reliable product that you can actually launch and that can, can do important you know, business uh, decisions for your company uh, in real time. And so all of these companies have built what are called machine learning platforms, infrastructure that allows their engineers and data scientists to build, maintain, and operate machine learning applications all the way from data to production. And they have teams of hundreds of people working on just this infrastructure, which then allows uh, other product teams to build uh, these hundreds or maybe thousands of internal ML applications that these businesses have. So just as some examples, in Google, uh, the, uh, you know, Google open source TensorFlow, but they have a whole platform called TensorFlow Extended, TFX, that teams use internally to develop applications. Uh, Uber has a platform called Michelangelo that supports hundreds of applications. Facebook has FB Learner, and so on. So these are, these are kind of the engines that power actually productionizing machine learning and, and having hundreds of use cases on it. So when we started looking at uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this domain at Databricks three years ago, uh, we, we, again, we, we saw that these companies were building them. Every company's ML platform was very customized and uh, internal and bespoke for their architecture. And we thought that there has to be a better way. And so we asked, can we design an open ML platform where actually a wide range of um, organizations can, con can contribute on this and make it shared infrastructure as opposed to something you have to build yourself? And that's what we did with MLflow, the open source uh, machine learning platform. So MLflow is, a, is an open source project at the Linux Foundation, and it provides four key capabilities that you need to productionize uh, machine learning. Um, it's got components for tracking or monitoring how your application is doing over time, 
for reproducible runs of your application, for packaging and deploying models, and also for reviewing and centrally sharing models to the model registry component. And these components are designed so that uh, all of the users involved at different aspects of the machine learning lifecycle can easily collaborate on these applications, make sure they're working correctly, and troubleshoot any problems that come out. But MLflow is also open in another really critical way, which is that it's designed to have an open interface so you can easily plug it into your favorite machine learning systems, uh, even internal systems you have, or into your favorite you know, vendor products that live alongside that lifecycle. So it can be used in any programming language and it can be used in any machine learning library, and it also connects automatically to many popular commercial services to allow you to switch between them when you deploy your, uh, your application and easily use you know, best-in-breed tools to manage your applications. So if you're not familiar with MLflow, uh, I'll just highlight a few of the things it can do. Uh, the first way most users begin using it is through the tracking component, which allows you to track experiments while you're developing your model and then track production runs of it once you finish developing it to make sure that it continues doing well over time. So in, in a lot of machine learning libraries today, the actually uh, the community has created connectors to make uh, tracking in MLflow super easy. So for example, here I'm showing some code to train uh, a model uh, in Keras. Um, if you want to start instrumenting that process with MLflow and keep track of all the information in real time, you just need to call the MLflow uh, Keras autolog function, and that will actually automatically uh, instrument Keras and capture all the relevant information about the model that you're training. Uh, and so that will give you in MLflow this, this nice you know, uh, graphical interface where you can see all the times you've trained the model before, you can compare it over time, you can experiment with different parameters, uh, and you can also see you know, which versions of your code were used, and so you can immediately start um, you know, structuring your development process and making it much easier to troubleshoot issues. Now that's just experiment tracking. Another key aspect of MLflow is the model registry. This is a collaborative environment, a little bit like GitHub, where you can register all your models and keep track of multiple versions of them and move your models through a software development lifecycle where they can pass through stages uh, such as testing and production um, and different users or automated systems can approve changes to them before you, uh, you, know, before you actually deploy them. So this is another key um, uh, uh, element of the platform uh, that actually lets you centrally manage these models and make sure the right one is used in each application the same way you would centrally manage you know, different versions of software. Finally, MLflow has a lot of built-in connectors from the community to different ways of deploying the model. So one of the really powerful features is whatever library you use to develop the model, once you put it in the registry, it's in the standard packaging format that we call uh, MLflow model format. And then there are actually all these tools where you can easily deploy the same model without having to know how it was trained, you know, what software version, what libraries, and so on. So for example, you can take the model and put it into any of a number of uh, open source or commercial online serving tools. You can do batch inference on massive data sets using Apache Spark. You can just load the model into code and call into it there, or you can push it to edge devices. And so you get this whole ecosystem where you don't have to uh, write something special to get your model into these different uh, deployment modes. Um, so we're very excited with the continued momentum of the project. The community has grown a huge amount. Um, uh, and you can just see in this plot here, over the past year, we've grown to uh, over 5 million monthly downloads of MLflow on PyPy, and over 300 contributors to the project just in the past three years since we launched the project. And on Databricks, with the hosted version we provide, we've seen tremendous growth as well. Uh, today, uh, we have thousands of customers using uh, MLflow on the platform, and they're creating more than one and a half million um, experiment runs per week that are producing new models that you know, then, then they work with. So a huge amount of uh, production machine learning happening uh, you know, just through, through this platform. So what's new in MLflow over the past year? There's been a lot of activity in the community, and I just wanted to highlight some of the new things. One of the big efforts over the past year has been to make it easier to integrate MLflow into an existing application, and we've done that by adding auto-logging packages for a lot of popular libraries, like I showed before with Keras. 
We're actually making this even um, easier now by adding a single mlflow.autolog API, which automatically detects which ML libraries you're using and enables logging for all of those. So it'll be very straightforward. If you have you know, an existing piece of code, you can just add this one line in there and start capturing detailed information about the training data and the code and the parameters uh, that you use, and of course, the models themselves, um, and begin you know, operating on that information. We've also uh, added a whole bunch of new features to tracking. Uh, one of these is built-in support for model interpretability using the popular SHAP library. So you can now log explanations of your model and get uh, these, these graphics that explain you know, exactly why the model is making specific predictions. And obviously this is super useful when you're reviewing your model before you decide whether to deploy a new version to quickly understand you know, why it's making predictions and what's different from the previous one. Um, you can also log uh, arbitrary objects now, like figures and text files and images and so on, so you can customize the information that you're logging in MLflow. Um, and you, we also have an MLflow thin client package that has uh, much fewer um, runtime dependencies that you can use if you want a, a lightweight way to, to explore the data you have in MLflow from an application without pulling in all of its dependencies. So these all make it easier to work with it. And then on the deployment side, we've also got a lot of activity on deployment backends. Uh, there were quite a few supported in the project already. And in the past year, we've also added Ray, Algorithmia, and PyTorch uh, TorchServe as ways you can deploy your models on there. So you, once you save a model, you have a huge variety of uh, options for how to use it. And it's just one line of code, regardless of your model type, to get it into any of these serving systems. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight in the community that I'm really excited about is the integration between MLflow and PyCarrot. Uh, so MLflow is actually now part of the, uh, is, is, a, is a key part of the, the PyCarrot uh, um, machine learning library. If you're not familiar with PyCarrot, it's a popular um, low-code machine learning library that you can use in Python. Basically, with just a few lines of code, you can, um, you can load in some data, it can understand the features in the data, and it can try a variety of algorithms and give you what is now a deployable and manageable model using MLflow. So it's a very popular library for just getting started with machine learning. Um, and so the way it works in PyCard, this is you know, some, basically a complete PyCard application that, uh, that uh, trains a model uh, on some insurance data. And actually in, in this um, uh, application, uh, in case you haven't uh, noticed, um, there's actually uh, a, th this code in here is what enables MLflow. So if you're using PyCard, you call your setup function, you can just provide an experiment name in your MLflow server, and it will automatically log all that information into MLflow. You don't need to do anything uh, else uh, to get it. And so you can just run, you know, you see it's very little code to actually uh, experiment with lots of models in PyCard, and if you add these parameters in there, you automatically get this, this information in the MLflow UI, and then you can manage your models there, you know, share them with users, review them, and so on. There's actually a whole talk about this at the summit. I invite you to check it out if you want to see how to connect MLflow to low-code, you know, automated machine learning. Um, finally, we have quite a bit of exciting uh, work on the roadmap ahead for MLflow this year. And of course, we'd love to get your feedback as we develop these things, you know, in, a, in the open source uh, uh, Slack channel. Um, so one uh, thing that we're continuing to push on is the integration with the PyTorch ecosystem. PyTorch has a wide variety of really powerful tools for uh, model explanation, interpretability, profiling, and so on. And these are two, two of the things we're working on today. So first of all, we're integrating with the Captum library, which is a model interpretability library powered by PyTorch, and we'll be integrating those visualizations directly into the MLflow UI. Um, if you haven't seen Captum, Captum makes it very easy to interpret the prediction of a wide range of models uh, using the latest and greatest methods for that. So you can use it for computer vision to see what objects it's detecting. You can use it for text to explain the predictions of language models. You can, of course, just use it for simple you know, models on numerical uh, features as well. And you'll be able to take all these things, log them into MLflow, and compare them across your experiments over time. Um, we're also integrating with the PyTorch profiler for debugging the performance of your deep learning models. 
Um, another uh, major area we're starting on is model evaluation. So you've logged all these models in MLflow, maybe you've deployed them, how do you now evaluate you know, how they're doing? So there are two uh, projects there. The first one is offline evaluation. Let's say you've logged a whole bunch of models and you want to compare them, maybe on a specific slice of the data or a new test that you've collected. We're going to have APIs that makes it very easy to do that. And then the other one is online evaluation. When you deploy a model, we'll make it easy to also deploy a code that actually outputs, you know, captures and, and saves the, the, the predictions and the inputs that went into the model into a standard format like Delta Lake. So you can now get these streaming predictions and start evaluating the online predictions and see how they compared to, you know, the data that you trained the model on. Um, a third thing that we're doing is integration with production job systems. So for example, in, in Databricks, we're integrating MLflow tracking directly into the user interface for our job scheduler, so you can actually see the metrics and artifacts and so on produced by MLflow directly there. And this is also something that we'd like to, to do with other job schedulers in the open source project. So this is sort of a, a, a sneak peek at, at how it will look. This is the jobs interface in Databricks. You can see, you know, we've run this job a bunch of times in the past few days, and you can actually see the custom MLflow metrics we have for this job directly in the interface. So I can quickly eyeball this and see whether my job, you know, is starting to do poorly from an ML perspective, even if it actually successfully you know, completed and ran on time. And actually we can see here, one time I actually had too many null records in the data, which is something I was able to just track. And this is, you know, surfaced right here in the UI. So I could quickly see that and fix the model. And finally, the fourth thing that we're doing is, uh, is more work on the open source uh, MLflow server to make it easy to customize it. So for example, we're working on a plugin API so you can have webhooks or custom logic every time an event happens in MLflow, and so you can easily connect it into your organization's uh, you know, machine learning lifecycle. So there's an exciting roadmap uh, ahead from MLflow, uh, and we'd love to get your feedback from it. Uh, the final thing I wanted to mention is that we also think we're getting close enough in terms of, uh, you know, experience with the project to actually launch MLflow 2.0. And this is a chance to, to actually improve a lot of the core APIs and data models and maybe add new capabilities. Uh, so we're, we've launched a survey where we'd love to get your feedback on machine learning infrastructure in general, and in particular what you'd like to see in MLflow 2.0. So make sure you check that out, whether you're a current user or not. We'd love to hear what will make it easier for you uh, to build an ML platform at your company and reliably uh, deploy and maintain machine learning applications.